so wow. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for staying until uh, the end. <laughs> so uh, the panel that we are going to present today uh, is titled The Transition Industry and Profession. We insist on profession, not only industry. Uh, past, present, and the future. So I think this is a very ambitious program, uh, I must confess. Uh, and so we've been, you know, uh, lately talking a lot about, you know, technology, evolution, AI, but, you know, I noticed that all panelists and all moderators are still using papers as a note, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so th this is the evolution. So we are gathered here today to reflect on the evolution of our uh, industry and profession over the last 30 years. So it's a long, long, long history. Uh, is it still the same industry uh, and profession? Uh, does uh, the industry and its labor force have a promising future? Uh, what about you know the technical and technological evolution and its impact on the industry? This is what we will be trying to uh, elaborate on with our panelists today. All panelists have at least one thing in common. Uh, they all have been in the industry and profession for more than 30 years. Uh, and they are still full of energy and passion, which is, I think, a nice message of hope for all of us here gathered today. <laughs> so, let me now present quickly, I say quickly because, you know, with uh, their experience, you know, it could take one hour before I actually finish their biographies. So, I will start with Evelyn Chauvehead. Uh, Evelyn started as a translator and then moved to different uh, roles in the language and resource management. And she has a vast experience in uh, resource event management, and she's now at Stockard uh, as resource manager. We have also Doris Hernandez, holder of a law and translation degree. Doris, Doris has an extensive experience in translating, both as a freelancer and in-house resource. She currently works in the Spanish translation section of the United Nations office in Vienna. Anthony Pim author and editor of some 30 books and 230 articles in the field of translation and intercultural studies. Sorry. Anthony is currently visiting scholar at Università Cas Foscari in Venice. He's also teaching in, in other universities that I will not mention here, uh, in Spain, South Africa, and Australia, among others. Celia, hello Celia, Celia Rico, she's currently a visiting professor uh, in translation technology at Universita, uh, Universita Complutense de Madrid. Her research focuses on the use of MT and other translation technologies, MTPE and quality evaluations. And last but not least, Rudy Thierry, more than 30 years experience in the language industry and profession in different language and management roles, privileged witness to the creation of today's language industry. He continues to coordinate the um, annual Ellis survey, which he initiated uh, in 2013, to monitor how global trends, processes, and technology are shaping the future of the industry and all its stakeholders. So, now, uh, can we have the slide, the first slide? Okay, so uh, as we said earlier, we're going to focus on how the business ecosystem, so the industry, the companies, and the technology evolved over the, over the years. But also, and this is the most important part of the panel afterwards, is the impact on this evolution, which is either 
technological or uh, business, how it has impacted the people working in the industry. Rudy uh, has prepared a very, very interesting timeline that he will descri describe now. Over to you, Rudy. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Claudio. Um, don't take these dates and lines and so on really as the Bible. That's uh, certainly not the intention. The intention here of the, uh, of the graph is more uh, to give you an idea of the, the time frames that, uh, uh, that we're talking about. I promise I will not talk about 30,000 years of history or 200,000 years, uh, but about 40 years more or less. Um, and I drew a line there, the blue vertical line, which, in my opinion, um, marks the difference between a pre-industry uh, era or age in the language industry and the current age that we live in. Uh, why am I talking about the pre-industry uh, age, age or era? Simply because at that moment, there uh, around the 90s, beginning of the 90s, end 80s, beginning 90s, um, before that, uh, we did have, obviously, freelance translators, and we did have small and medium-sized translation agencies, and there were a few that were already specialized in automotive uh, and so on, and we did already, uh, or it existed already, a uh, form of language technology, because, uh, as you probably know, uh, Sistra exists already for a very long time. Uh, Alps, uh, the, the name probably doesn't ring a bell f with many of you, but uh, it was uh, the first, one of the first uh, uh, CAT and TMS systems around. Um, they existed already before that era. Uh, the reason, uh, uh, however, why I consider it pre-industrial is that there was no scale. There was no scale, there was no structure. So in my opinion, the industry didn't exist, really, at that moment. So why is that, uh, that uh, moment of the 90s, early 90s, so important? There were a number of th things that happened at the same time, but that are all interlinked at that moment. Uh, for instance, a company like Microsoft decided in the mid-90s that suddenly they wanted to uh, address their whole global community due to the uh, globalization of the market, and they wanted to address them all uh, through SIM chipping, SIM shipping, that was the buzzword at that moment, uh, their software. So send out all the language versions of their software at the same time as the original English. And to do so, they wanted to be able to work with companies that were able to uh, support all their languages. We're talking about 20 plus at that moment. Not the 100 that they're doing now, but 20 plus. Not a single company at that moment was capable of doing that. But Microsoft wanted to do it, and Apple was already doing something similar as well, but with a different, uh, with a different focus that I'm not going to in, into now. Um, what happened was that was a business trigger that happened at that moment, and a number of companies, four or five worldwide, at that moment took the opportunity to start off on an M&A campaign. Uh, they started to buy companies all over the world in order to create a worldwide company that would be able to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, meet that need. Now, um, because of that, that also drew the attention of uh, technology providers. Um, Yap, certainly, I'm, I'm not sure if he's still around. Uh, but uh, he was one of the first developers of uh, uh, CAT tools uh, with the ink tools at that moment. But uh, there was another uh, younger kid on the block that uh, was named Trados, uh, you all know. Uh, and they managed to sell their product to Microsoft. And that opened the eyes of high te uh, the, the big tech, like Microsoft, like Apple at that moment, but also Siemens and so on, uh, that uh, opened their eyes to the possibilities of scaling up 
the localization, the translation of their, uh, of their products. And that, at the same time, opened up the eyes of the finance world to say, hey, something is happening in that language industry. Nobody in the finance world had taken uh, even a closer look at the, fin and the language industry before. But now with, these technology, with this technology, with the higher volumes, with the globalization, suddenly there was interest. And before the, the, that, that moment, the, um, I, would, I would say that the focus of the, the pre-industry industry was on the product. It was product-centric. Everybody was talking about their translation, the translation product. And that was because 90% of the owners of translation agencies at that moment, and a fortiori the, the independent translators, were all translators. So their focus was on the product. Suddenly, you have an influx of people from outside the industry, finance, uh, finance people, economics, and so on, uh, that uh, have a different focus. And the focus shifted from product to business. That created a clash. And we still feel the clash here in this room today. People who say, yeah, yeah, that's, uh, the, the benefits of AI go to the high tech, the, to big tech. It's not going to the translator. Yeah, sure. And th that's, that is the business law at this moment. The problem is that nobody took the time or the effort to explain to the language professionals the business reasonings behind the whole thing and created a kind of a consensus uh, that everybody understands where everybody's coming from and what the implications are. So the, uh, that's, that's the big turning point. Since then, we are in a language industry. Now, the technology, as I said, Trados Workbench came out in that, er in that era which was a product that was very quickly adopted, simply because, because of two factors. First, it was under pressure of the clients. They simply imposed it. Uh, and I'm not meaning the MLVs or the SLVs. I mean the end clients. They said, well, you're going to use this, or uh, you're not going to work for us. It was simple as that. Uh, that is one thing. The other thing is that everybody was, uh, it was super clear for everybody that this was a useful technology. Not just for the client, but also for the translator. It was very easy to, uh, to explain. Uh, it's different with other technologies like translation management systems, uh, TMS systems, which have been around for a very long time, but were always in the background, but were uh, adopted uh, afterwards, late 90s, but more in the 2000s. Um, and then we have machine translation, which has been around forever, almost, but which only became fat, well, not fashionable, but... Uh, effective? No. Effect, well, effective or uh, at least credible. Credi econ economically Sexy, credible. maybe. Sexier. Well, <laughs> yes, <laughs> you could name that. Uh, in uh, 2017, indeed, when, uh, uh, when DeepL came out and the uh, uh, Google Translate and the, NM the NMT engine. Um, and now we have Chat, chat uh, GVT since actually only this year. Okay, it was announced or something like that in uh, last year. But it, it has taken the world by storm. Now, I don't know how uh, extensive it's really used, either in our industry or in other industries. It's a hype. How it is really actually used, I don't know. But what we know is that you, you clearly see that uh, the, the span, uh, the, the time it takes to, uh, to adopt something is now extremely short with chat GPT. Um, and uh, there's, there's been a number of other uh, elements there in, in the graph that you can look at. We're not going to go into the, those, but uh, um, the, an, an one thing that you should not um, uh, forget is that all these technologies now, they don't exist anymore separately. Uh, uh, TMs, TMS, MT, AI, you, you cannot buy a technology suite today that does not have everything. Everything is in there. 
the only caveat there is that all these functionalities are still separate within those suites. And that is something that we may be discussing afterwards. Well. Indeed. Thank you, Rudy. And I think that uh, this visual representation of the evolution uh, is really interesting. And especially you were saying that uh, the different technologies you know, are not hand in hand, but they, s they seem to be in the same cloud. This is very important. Um, well, based on this evolution, I would like to ask a first question to all panelists, which is a very general question. You will hear a lot about perception during this panel. Uh, so according to you, um, how this evolution is actually perceived by the different stakeholders in the uh, industry and profession, uh, in the sector that you respect respectively represent. Celia, uh, could you start with? Yes, thank you. Um, okay, the first word that comes to my mind is uneasiness. I see this feeling in my students when I'm teaching at university. I see this feeling when I talk to my colleagues at academia. And whenever I talk to freelance translators, the idea is, where are we? What's, ha what's happened just in, in the past four years? Everything has changed. So this feeling of uneasiness, um, I think it springs from a kind of paradigm shift. Everything is new, new content, new processes, new methods, new needs. Everything is new. This is a kind of example. Um, we see how much enormous content uh, generated by users online. Um, we've been talking about this today. Um, but this new content needs to be translated, but not necessarily from a human translator. So we're, we're uh, taking the machine to translate that kind of content that needs to be translated, right? So this takes us to a kind of paradox. Um, the human translator uh, seems to be losing visibility in the industry. But global market uh, recognize the need for a multilingual um, view of their contents if they want to sell their products and services. We see that in localization, in brand management, customer support, or user engagement. So this is a kind of paradox. And I want to bring two main questions inside this new paradox. One is, uh, what's the role of the translator? And the other is, what's the role of uh, quality? How we are going to define quality in this new um, system? So uh, the idea is, I would say, the translator needs to uh, place a step forward and take a leading role in the industry, active role saying, I am the expert, I am the one who uh, is going to decide when and how we are going to use the uh, technology. And in, um, in quality, I, um, I would say the market is ready to accept different levels of quality. I know this is a controversial idea, but the market is ready for that. So I would say um, if uh, human quality is needed, which I think it is. Uh, let's see if we can assume a, a premium um, premium service, right? Let's let's conceive human quality in translation as a premium service, and the market needs to be ready to pay for this um, premium service. So that will be my take here. Thank you, Celia. Uh, Anthony, what is your <laughs> wake up? <laughs> What is your perception of this evolution, I, I, more, I more personally? I don't know, because um, there might be a half a million translators and interpreters in the world, and I haven't met them all. I think what you have to do whenever there's a moment of disruption and change is to go out and find what's happening and get some data. And I'm really, really missing some empirical data about these questions. So what I've done, I've looked at the studies that have been carried out on what translators think about technologies in general, mainly machine translation, but also uh, translation memories, and the studies are actually from before last November, so they don't deal with AI. I'm looking at Gerberoff, who was here earlier today, Orrego Carmona, Cadwell O'Brien Teixeira, Lobley Orrego Carmona, former doctoral students, by the way, not all of them, Flanagan, Madonna Dolmayer, and Brian Mossop especially. Uh, that comes out to about 500 people, okay? Now, translators, look, looking at the data, 
are really not against technology at all. But there are two things you've got to notice. One is generations. There's a big age difference there. People who got to the top of the profession with one technology sort of downplay the other technologies. Not let, I don't want other ladders getting to the top, and let's, let's throw that away, okay? So, so Brian Mossop, a Korea translator for the uh, Canadian government, was cited earlier, if you can't translate with a pen and paper, you can't translate. Fair enough, okay? But Brian, who's a very eloquent writer, actually, on this subject, just looks and he, he, he says, look, this use of memory, he, he's lumping all the technologies together as the use of memory, which is fair enough, I think. Databases, memory. He says, what you've done here is redefine quality. Fair enough. Quality has become a variable. Fair enough. Now, find people who want to work like that. Good. Go and get them. But he says, I became a translator in order to translate. Parentheses. Compose suitable wordings in the target language not to fix someone else's recycled wordings. And well said. That was his motivation. That's what he's done all his life. That's a noble way to proceed. And I have every respect for that. And then he recognizes this market is no longer for me. The generation younger than that, we do see in signs of not rejection like that, but cognitive friction. It takes time to get used to it, and people have been adapting to it. Uh, uh, people who had to start post-editing at first, no, never, this is not translation, we'll never do that, come back two years later and, hey, you know what? There are definite advantages to this. And we find that degree of acceptance. Now, the study on uh, automation anxiety uh, by Nunes uh, Veira uh, brings out this, this broad acceptance among the community that we can adapt, we are open-minded, we the 500 people here, not the half million out there that I haven't seen. Uh, but uh, they don't mind the technologies. The anxiety concerns the business practices around them. Uh, this has come in. Neural came in uh, in a period of perceived declining prices for translations. It's in the interview data. I haven't seen reliable data for the actual payment of translators. But there was a perceived crisis there. And that was mapped on to the effect of the technology. Wrongly or badly, it doesn't matter. It's in the data, it's what perceived, and that produced the anxiety. Uh, what do you do with that anxiety? I'm sorry, it's not just explaining business to them, because they can figure out business a bit. It's a fact of automation. Since the first industrial revolution, automation across the board, not just computer automation, one of the main effects is wage dispersion. The people, wage dispersal, uh, the people who work with it and control the technology and develop it get richer and the rest stay where they are or get marginally poorer and some jobs disappear. Uh, that is cause for anxiety in the community. Now, the way out of that, I suggest, is pretty obvious. It's to employ people for the new tasks that have been mentioned, content development, especially transcreation. These are, are good terms for very good jobs that can be done with the help of the technologies. But the bottom line is, I mean, I hear the word talent crunch a lot from people in the industry. Talent crunch, fair enough. You, can't, you know what? If you want that talent, you have to pay good money for it. Uh, the business model, thank you very much. You know, we understand business. But what we have to do is, is get these communicative talents that we do train people for and get people to get up there and present themselves well and negotiate and go for the big money because that's how business works. Sell yourself, sell the talents that you've got. People in business are aware that they need it. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Do you want to, someone wants to react? Or? Quickly? Yeah, very, very quickly. Uh, about the talent crunch, uh, I think talent crunch is a word, is a, is a global word, but there's, you have to ask the question, for what do you need the talent? Uh, and if you, if you say, uh, it's right, rightfully so, uh, if you want talent, pay for, uh, pay for talent. As a company at that moment, you need to decide what do I need that particular talent for? And can I sell that talent to my client? Uh, does my client need that talent or not? 
And if they are not pay, uh, ready to pay for it, I'm not talking about the translation companies, but the end, the end client, if they're not uh, uh, ready to pay for that, ta- uh, for that talent, you need to find another solution to, like, through automation, improve the automation, improve the technology, or step out of business, not just as, a, uh, as an individual, but as a company even. Yes, t- talent, uh, exactly what Evelyn <laughs> knows a lot about. <laughs> so, Evelyn, uh, as uh, your, you know, with your long experience in vendor management and resource management, what, what is your perception of this evolution? Uh, you can choose both evolution or uh, just you know, the industry or uh, the technology, um, quickly. <laughs> it's okay. It's working? Okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, First of all, I just wanted to, to go back quickly to the timeline that Rudy presented. Um, I started my career in 1994, which was way before all these technologies uh, you know, were implemented in the market. And what I have to say, and uh, Rudy is quite right in saying that, first of all, Trados was very easily accepted because we uh, quickly understood the benefits of working with Trados. Um, With MT, I think it was a bit more difficult because there was a lot of skepticism at the beginning um, on the result of the MT output first and on the fact that potentially um, there was a fear within the translation uh, community that there might be a risk of losing business. So I think that was the main difference. But after all, I think that um, all in all, translators basically are very flexible people. And they have realized that they needed to adapt to the changes in the business. Because if they didn't adapt, they would lose business. And I think that's, that's been understood by many people. Although uh, today I still receive uh, applications from people who are basically not willing to do uh, empty post editing because they have decided that it's not for them. And I think it's fair enough, you know, you decide what, what you want to do as, as a, you know, as a professional. But I think it's important to mention as well that you potentially close doors. And there's a risk of losing business if you are not willing to adapt to changing technologies. So I think it's, it's an important thing to say. Um, I'm confident that basically uh, with AI... Um, there will be new opportunities for translators. I, I'm, I'm not a specialist, so I, can't really, I, I don't really have an opinion on that. But I think that new opportunities will be created. They, they exist already. We, we were mentioning the prompts creation, but I, it's not only that. And I think that that's the key term. That's the adaptability and the flexibility. And at the end of the day, um, translators have to make a living. And it's going to be the most important thing that they ha- will have to decide. Uh, how can I make a decent living? Will I have to basically stick to, let's say, human translation? Do I have to um, specialize more in empty post editing? Or do I have to uh, accept that I will have to invest time and learn new um, tasks as part of the development of AI? Thank you. Um, Doris, what about your opinion on this perception? Maybe from, uh, let's say, with your career as a freelance translator, in-house also translated at the UN. So how this evolution has been perceived? Hello. Yes, uh, about perceptions, and you ask about the percep- uh, perceptions of stakeholders in the sector. I'm going to refer to the institutional sector, uh, mainly international organizations and the UN That's uh, what I've been working um, in uh, for most of my career. So um, it would be like how I perceive that they perceive, so my perception on their perceptions. And the main stakeholders in this sector are uh, member states, first of all, um, who we could call the clients, because since uh, they are the ones who pay for our services, then the managers of translation services and translation staff. So uh, I think that member states uh, see technology as an opportunity uh, to achieve time and cost efficiencies because, of course, they want to see a return on their investment. They want to see that uh, costs are reduced. So in this regard, I'm 
inviting the elephant back into the room because we cannot separate technology from uh, financial aspects. And then as to managers, I think that they see the evolution as an opportunity to achieve the cost efficiencies demanded by member states and therefore deliver their mandate. It helps them look good before their bosses, of course, and perform better. But they can also see uh, threats and risks in, in that evolution because there are always implementation problems. Whenever you introduce a new technology at the beginning, uh, users will find problems, not only to, to learn, sometimes uh, they blame translators saying that they are not quick enough to learn or they cannot learn, but sometimes there are actual problems in the technology when it's being introduced. And then there's also the threat or risk of labor conflicts as pressure is increased on translation staff for higher productivity. And with regard to, to staff, to in-house translators, uh, they can see technology uh, as a challenge uh, because they have to learn it. They have to integrate it in their daily work and they need to adjust to changes and that can be quite challenging. Um, some can perceive it as a threat uh, because if they don't learn it or they don't uh, make the best out of it, they can have a potential negative impact on their performance evaluation. And of course there are others who see this as an opportunity. Um, they can use it to increase their productivity and improve their performance. They can participate in new projects, uh, also leading to a positive impact on their performance evaluation. And others uh, can see it as a, an opportunity to reorient their careers, pursue other jobs, uh, either in technology-related tasks or, or managerial aspects. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Doris. Uh, now we will start the first uh, Slido uh, word cloud uh, with the simple question, exactly the same as uh, the one um, we uh, asked our panelists. So how would you illustrate in one word or two words your perception of the evolution of the business and uh, technology in the industry? If anybody wants to react live, feel free. Inevitable, yes, sure. <laughs> Exciting, so this is very positive. I see ivory tower. Well, this is really uh, also a, a real cliche in our industry. Opportunity, of course. <laughs> Of course, this is really focused on both trend, you know, the actual industry and the, uh, the technology, of course. Worrying. So all in all, it seems rather positive, no? No? What do you think? Surprised. <laughs> Ambivalent, yes. <laughs> Precarization. Super fast. Okay, we'll continue the, the panel right now. So now we're going to uh, really focus on the people, on the impact on people of this evolution. Uh, and I would like to uh, address my first question to Celia again. <laughs> so students at academic programs are mostly worried about how MT is going to affect their performance in the market and how uh, to incorporate it adequately in their translation processes. Connected to this, there is the question of uh, data and MT literacy as a means to understand what is behind technology. So Celia, can you give us your uh, view on this? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, I think that concerning data literacy, that's, this is a must for students. Um, this is something we are already taking care of at universities, uh, different degrees, and I see there are many um, projects and initiatives in training uh, students for data lit literacy. There are different projects like, um, well, we have this Data Lead MT by Professor Ralph Kruger. Ralph Kruger. There's also this MT literacy project by Professor Lynn Bauker or um, this project, uh, EU-funded project Multitrain by Tradumatica Group in, in Universitat Barcelona. So all these um, groups have developed teaching materials, data sets, courses, and open access, open access books 
So I think that uh, from the university, we're, we're doing our job. It's difficult to, to train uh, um, translators or linguistics people in, in data literacy, but we're doing our job. And I think, you know, we, we started to get good results in things like corpus compilation, annotation and processing, tokenization, understanding about word embeddings and so on. So I think the future generation is going to be ready to um, uh, adapt to the new changes in artificial intelligence and offer not only translation services as in, in a more traditional way, but also this um, computational linguistics uh, profile for the for the future companies. So I think I, I believe the, the the future is um, optimistic. I would say. Thank you, Celia. Um, Rudy. Um, I wanted to ask you this question. Um, we discussed this before. Uh, first, we got translation memories, uh, then uh, machine translation, then uh, now artificial intelligence. Uh, where will it end? This is the question. And uh, do individual professional, professionals have really to follow all those trends? The first question uh, I said with the, the timeline that these uh, the individual technologies are already merged into uh, suites, technology suites these days, whether you're using Trados or MemoQ or the others. Um, but in reality, uh, the, uh, each, each functionality is still operating separately in those suites. So the first thing that, in my opinion, is going to happen in the technology field is that there will be a much more natural merging of the functionalities, which will not anymore be the, the way that uh, things are done today, where a segment goes first through the CAD system and then goes through the MT and, and, and the AI and so on. Um, I would expect the same segment be analyzed in different, according to different uh, paradigms uh, uh, at the same time and an AI component to select the best solution, for instance. Uh, that would be one possibility. Uh, where it will end, actually, yesterday one of the participants asked the keynote speaker uh, what, uh, what is the future in 30 years for a young, uh, young uh, uh, professional today, and the keynote speaker uh, could not answer. Uh, I could not answer either where it's going after AI, because for a simple reason that AI for the first time is a multilateral, multi-faceted uh, technology. You can use it for a lot of different things. So uh, who am I to say that any new, uh, new development is not going to be possible with the AI principles that we have today already? Um, uh, Jaap, in the previous panel, uh, talked about translation out of the wall. Um, I could predict, uh, maybe, but that, that is not, nobody here in the room is going to live long enough to witness that, in my opinion, um, that, uh, yeah, there will not be any separate translation uh, service anymore that it will be built in. Yesterday the keynote speaker was talking about these implants. Um, probably we will be looking at something like that and translation will probably be part of that, uh, of the functionality of that implant in, in my opinion. But as I said, I'm not absolutely not going to live through that. <laughs> but no. That's my opinion. And then uh, Second, uh, second question, do, uh, do the language professionals need to follow all those threads? Of course not. Um, it's what uh, Anthony said before. Uh, if you think that you need to translate with pen and, paper, uh, pen and paper or pencil and paper, that's your good right. Uh, there, uh, if you think that that brings your best value to the people who are going to pay you or who are going to reward you in other ways. Because we're always thinking in, in certain slogans and certain slogans and word rates and things like that. But uh, the rewards can be, uh, can be different. Um, if you think that cat tools are your limit, then so be it. If you want to go into AI, yeah, 
Why not? But uh, so, it's your personal choice. Yeah, totally agree. And Anthony, uh, so do you think that it's still, even with uh, the lack of empirical data, as you were saying before, do you think it's still possible to know what the translators and linguists actually think about the new technologies? Uh, or do you think it's, uh, we're still missing information? Or, uh... I, I'm, I'm going to answer the question I expected. <laughs> no, the truth is, I, I confess, after more than 30 years, and we're all the old guys up here, right? I don't really care. <laughs> I mean, I'll tell you why. I mean, I, I don't know where it's going, etc. It's been great. I, I really enjoyed the task of translating. I'm going to retire and translate. Okay? Literature for the pleasure of it, with all the technologies. I don't believe this, you can't do it with literature stuff. Either. It can really help. I care about multilingualism. I care about maintaining the plurality of languages in our multilingual, super diverse cities. And instantly available, out of the wall translation threatens that. When you get translation as an immediately banal, reliable, trustworthy thing, People have a reason to not learn languages or to give in to the, the lingua francas of our world. And I think that's going to produce a much poorer society. So what I'm looking for, this is the, the future question, and what I really enjoy in the technologies are the most interactive kinds that can be used to help translators but are also used in all language learning. And I think that's, that's the other area we've got to look at and not exclude it from translation. It's got to be a complementary thing, that people can use these technologies to learn languages and play with languages and enjoy them when they're learning the language and when they're translating in a translator training program. So anything interactive, anything that offers a plurality of solutions and suggestions like DPL does now, if you click on the thing there or you change the SD and it changes automatically, anything interactive is going to help multilingualism. And that's where I would love to see all these technologies go. Unfortunately, the business models might not get us there, but there's more than business in the world. Thank you. You can approach. <laughs> I'd like to go back to, uh, to Doris with one question about the job descriptions uh, in the transition industry, especially in, the, um, in, your, in, your, uh, in your area, in your organization. Uh, change uh, are, have been made? Sorry? Okay. <laughs> change have been made or uh, are being made to the, description of the, tra the job description of the translation. Um, translators and reviewers are assuming tasks used they used to carry that by other professionals, like editors, reference staff, proofreaders, while old jobs are being renamed uh, or new jobs are being created. So what is the impact of, uh, uh, on their profiles and more generally on their uh, working conditions? I think this is a, an important uh, yes. um, part. Uh, about uh, profiles, uh, I've seen the evolution. Um, at first, translators only had their brains, their knowledge, their skills, um, and were not uh, required to have almost any type of technical skills. Some of them didn't know even what, uh, how to type. Uh, we were uh, required to dictate, and then the typing pools would uh, um, transcribe our, uh, our translations. <clears throat> And then with the advent of technology, um, that started to change. Um, also, I um, had to mention that at, at the beginning, uh, 40 years ago, there were very few translation schools in the world. So the uh, uh, translation services were staffed by professionals in many other are areas, like uh, lawyers, uh, engineers, uh, economists, uh, who also had uh, language skills. Uh, but then with um, the uh, emergence of translation schools, a, trans a translation degree uh, became uh, a requirement or a highly valued asset uh, when hiring a new translator. Uh, but then uh, technologies emerged and uh, uh, it seems that uh, only the, the, the techie ones, the nerdy, were the ones who were going to, to bloom and profit from this. And now uh, we're going back to the beginning, uh, making again um, an emphasis on soft skills, on uh, subject matter knowledge. 
So it's been interesting to see this going around or like a pendulum going back and forth. And then <clears throat> that also had an impact on, on the roles. Uh, as I said, at first we only translated or revised, did some terminology work, but then um, when we started typing our own translations in the personal computers, the typing pools or text processing sections began to be downsized, so we are doing part of that work. Uh, also, the reference sections, there were uh, professionals who provided us with the reference material. They did a lot of research. They also worked on terminology. Now the reference sections have been downsized or even disappeared, and we are doing that work as well. And also, perhaps not uh, as a direct consequence of technology, but as a, a consequence of financial constraints, the editing sections are also being downsized. Um, so uh, sometimes translators had to do some pre-editing uh, uh, work and uh, getting in touch with authors to clarify uh, or correct mistakes in the originals. Um, and also, uh, now there is less translating from scratch, a more revision and checking of uh, translation memories and machine translation, uh, and more work on building and improving our terminology database. So the profiles, the roles have changed, and the job descriptions is not something that you can change overnight in a big institution, but they, they are changing slowly and, and gradually. And then about the impact on working conditions, back to the elephant in the room, it's not the technology uh, by itself that is impacting the working conditions, but uh, the um, financial um, constraints and the expectations by member states that uh, we uh, increase our productivity. And of course, they don't want us to reduce quality, so that is a big dilemma. Uh, certain uh, translators who are not willing to resign quality complain that they have to work longer hours, sometimes during weekends or uh, holidays, to comply with the, the deadlines. Um, so this also leads to uh, uh, burnout, uh, health impacts, including mental health, yes. uh, mental health impacts. They also speak about lack of motivation because they don't feel valued as professionals because they're seen as just producers of, of words and not of uh, quality texts. Um, and so these the circumstances create uh, tensions in the workplace and pose challenges to the organization that is pressed to seek a balance between the demands and expectation of member states and the concerns of their staff. Yeah, and I have to ask one, and let's say last question, but uh, an important question to Evelyn about, you know, this uh, working condition, recruitment processes. Uh, there's been also some changes in the recruitment processes uh, as the focus changed. What about the financial stability of people working in the, in the profession? And last but not least, ca what can we do? Can we do a better job at explaining students, graduates, uh, the current reality and challenges of the translation industry, Evelyn? A lot of questions. Um, to go back to recruitment first, uh, you, you would tend to think that because, you know, because of this evolution, uh, we would look at different profiles. But at the end of the day, when we recruit translators, we're still looking at the fundamentals. We need people who can translate, who, who master their uh, mother tongue, and who know foreign languages. And unfortunately, I have to say that in recent years, I've seen uh, a serious decline in the mastering of the mother tongue. It's not an, an, an in, in uh, foreign languages as well. It's not unusual that when I receive application from uh, you know graduates or even experienced translators written in French, their mother tongue, I see spelling mistakes or grammar mistakes, and I see spelling mistakes and grammar mistakes in the CVs as well. So um, you know I think we, we need to refocus on what's important for a, 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 as a, as a skill for a translators, the knowledge of the language. Um, now, um, in recent years, obviously, uh, CAT tools uh, have been introduced in the uh, university curriculum, so that's a good thing. So we see uh, you know, graduates who actually know how to use a tool, and that's a good thing. But as, as it was mentioned yesterday during another panel, a tool can be taught relatively quickly. And if, uh, if a translator know, knows how to use a tool normally, they would quickly learn you know, other tools. 
Um, as was mentioned this morning as well, we have to look at the soft skills. Um, when we recruit in-house translators, it's absolutely important that we sort of determine if a person is going to fit into a team. So it has to be the communication skills, the, the openness to feedback, and the way people react, uh, you know, when, they, when they're being told that their translation is not good. So at the end of the day, uh, it's, it's quite different skills that we are looking at, but I don't think that they have changed um, because of the uh, evolution of technologies. So that's, that's my perspective. And, I, and, and again, um, I'm talking about uh, the recruitment of translators here. With regards to the financial stability, it's a tough, it's a tough one, um, because as, as you all know, um, translation is one of the profession when the rates have gone down in recent years. So if you want to make, to earn the same amount of money as you did 10 years ago, you have to work more. Um, and I think that leads to some people le leaving the profession because, um, you know, when you heard the result of the survey uh, that was mentioned by Goran this morning, that's, that, you know, that's quite worrying. People, some people can't make a living out of translation and now are moving to other professions which are linked to the languages, whether it's teaching or, you know, other jobs. So I think it's a concern that, um, at the end of the day, translators have to make a decent living, and um, I think it's not it, it's not easy at the moment because uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of pressure on prices as well. That we definitely in language you know the language service providers are, are obviously have to face as well. So uh, I think it's it's important to think about the future of the translation in from a from a financial perspective as well. You know. Right. Um, and your last question. Very uh, quickly, because uh, we still have one poll. <laughs> sorry. Uh, um, it, it's a topic uh, that is quite dear to me. It's how we, uh, employees from the language service providers, can make sure that students or graduates understand the, our needs and how we can, we can better communicate what is important for us. So I think that you know, there's still a little gap between the, the business world and the, the academia. And it's, I think we have to be more visible uh, in the sense that we, we, sh we have to be, you have to participate more, let's say, in, in discussions on, for instance, uh, you know, what is expected from a translator in terms of productivity, in terms of quality expectation. Um, and if, for, for people who, are, who basically intend to embark on a freelance career, we, we, we have to be very open about what they can charge, about what's going, going to be expected from, from them as well. So for me, that's, I think we still have to improve on that, yeah. on better th explain our expectations. I think this message is very, very clear and we all uh, concur. So we can start uh, the last poll uh, on Slido quickly. So uh, the question is very simple. How would you illustrate in one word the future of our industry and profession? So maybe also our panelists, maybe one word, also one word, not... Uh, <laughs> the future of our industry and profession. You want a word? Yes. Uh, Please, yeah. shoot. <laughs> well, the, no, in, the, in the industry, the word is resilient. You look at the previous crises and the way it's adapted, like capitalism. It was supposed to die a century ago, but it keeps getting reinvented. So does translation or cross-cultural communication or mediation or whatever you want to call it. We'll be fine. So it seems uncertain, resilient, evolving, challenging. Uh, I don't want to sound bleak, but... Uh, <laughs> for bleak. There is bleak. Uh, yeah, I've no, seen bleak. I know, but I don't like the word. Um, for the industry, I'm optimistic. For the people in the industry, less so. Okay. Well, I think that we can leave it with this uh, last comment. Or maybe, Celia, quickly? No, I would just say that I will call for human empowerment with the use of artificial intelligence. That's nice. <laughs> okay, now we will uh, maybe... Uh, wrap up with uh, one small, let's say, slideshow, a vintage slideshow, 
uh, there was a museum here. Uh, we have our own, you know, very small museum, courtesy of Doris. So, uh, <laughs> Doris, maybe you can quickly comment if you want. <laughs> yes, that is the old dictaphone that was placed on my desk the first day I arrived in the UN and told that I had to use that machine to dictate my translations. Then the Wang machine in the previous uh, slide uh, that was used by the typing poles. Then the personal computers. Uh, at first, we only had one per office to use to uh, do research, and then we were given one per person, and that's when we started typing. Uh, and then the um, currently we usually use two or more uh, monitors, and we use the the cat tools, the Iluna um, uh, tool. Thank thank you for uh, sending us those. Uh uh, let's say vintage picture. I think it's uh, very nice. So uh, we still have some time for uh, some questions from the audience, please. <laughs> Not always the same. <laughs> so, so I will veto you. I'm sorry. You can ask afterwards. <laughs> Someone? So uh, lady in uh, green. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you so much. My name is Claudia and I'm here uh, representing the Polytechnic of Porto. And I come from Portugal and unfortunately our reality is that we don't have certified translators. So anyone can translate and they are, they are able to do it for a really low price. They don't care about it. So our teachers tell us that we make the market. And right now it's quite scary because we have AI and machine translation, translation coming after us, but we also have the market that is against us. So my question for you is, what can I do to, have, to make enough to leave? Should I give up and just accept that I'm going to receive extremely poorly or just change careers? What, what's your, how can we solve this? Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Please don't give up. <laughs> Please. So, who wants to answer? Do you consider yourself a good translator? Um, hopefully so. I'm trained yeah. to be a good translator. Yeah. Um, have you been working with peers to become better? Yeah. We yeah. Can. Okay. That's a good start. Uh, I just want to refer to what other speakers have said already yesterday and today. Brand yourself. Uh, I think it was Lisa yesterday uh, or, um, that uh, was talking about empathy towards your clients. Uh, try to build that. Uh, I don't remember. Oh, no, Heike, Heike said that in her 25 years of career, only three translators ever contacted her uh, spontaneously to know about her company. Do that. Uh, Portugal is a, is a smallish market, obviously. The fact that there are no certified translators doesn't matter at all. Uh, in other countries, certified translators are only uh, certified for legal uh, or judicial documents. So that doesn't matter about the, the rest of the free market. Um, believe in yourself, and yeah, if you consider yourself a good translator, don't quit. Uh, Anthony, you want to uh, react? It's a footnote, because I met Claudia on the train. And she does conference interpreting with Portuguese, English, and Japanese. She's got to be famous. Okay. <laughs> so, do we have time for another question? Where? Okay. Over to you. Can I use this? Does that? Um, Anthony mentioned joy, the joy of translation, enjoying translation. I'm I'm a translator, and I enjoy translation. I've done a little bit of post-editing, and I find it very tedious and a chore. And I'm curious. I mean, I've not done much of it for that very reason. People with more experience. Is there anybody who finds joy in post-editing? <laughs> yeah? Yeah? Mm? Okay. Doris, you want to reply to this question? Um, 
Um, someone said yesterday that in order to be good in post editing, or perhaps we don't really use post editing, but we use uh, um, auto suggest and translation memory, you really have to be um, an expert in what you are translating and you need to be confident. Uh, so I really enjoy finding the mistakes um, <laughs> and I really enjoy improving. Excellent. Uh, Improving the output of the of the machine, said, so, "Ha! Huh, you know, I can do this better." And really, I can excel with my subject matter expertise and my language skills. But I use that. I use that as a base uh, to make it faster. But I can improve it. So to me, it's challenging and uh, it's fun. The joy of improvement. <laughs> well, I think we can wrap up now. Well, thank you very much uh, for your time. Thanks to all the panelists for your fantastic contribution. And uh, please join me in the round of applause to the panelists. So, thank you very much. A few last words from us today. Uh, well, again, uh, Claudia already mentioned the museum. If you haven't visited it, uh, please do so, whether you look back at those days with nostalgia or <laughs> prefer to leave them uh, behind.